So, so the, the symptoms people have are physical, they're mental, they're physiological. Um, and people talk about, you know, difficulty finding clothing that fits, you know, the impossibility of getting a bra that fits well, upper back and neck pain, you know, pins and needles in their arms, um, limiting their ability to their exercise, changing their exercise habits. So these women who might have played loads camogie or football or love running or Irish dancing when they were younger, um, when they started to develop breasts and their breasts got bigger and got heavier and they became self-conscious about them or it just became too uncomfortable, they stopped exercising, which feeds into a whole bit about female health, which I know you're really interested in, but that women don't, women tend to, when you look at the studies of like growing up in Ireland and so on, the, the amount of physical activity that our kids do tends to really fall off in girls in their teens. And this, is, I think, is one of the reasons is self-consciousness. Ailish, what a pleasure it is to have you today. Thanks, Laura. Ailish, you are a plastic surgeon. Correct. So, talk to me about boobs, <laughs> specifically Irish boobs, because there's loads of questions in this uh, question box that I put out about breast reductions. And I'm sh a bit shocked. I always thought people would want breast enlargements. Yeah, well, um, I do spend a lot of my time talking about boobs and I've kind of, I've got, um, I've got an absence of kind of the normal social filter. So I do sometimes find myself talking about boobs with people who then start to look a bit uncomfortable because <laughs> I've realised I've said the word boobs several times, but I feel like that's not going to happen with you particularly. I feel like you're very comfortable in this area. I could talk about anything. Yeah, yeah. there's very little that would shock me. And yeah. actually, the reason why we I have you here is because you messaged me once, once about, you commented on something, and I went and looked at your page and you have these pictures up of the surgeries that you've done or like, you know, the pores and afters. And I messaged you back going, God, women's bodies go through an awful lot. And you said they do... And the amount of women that come to me and they've they've lived with this with a shame of their bodies for years and they feel ashamed about getting help. So this is breaking down these barriers today, isn't that right? Yeah, well, hopefully, because I think one of the things I suppose plastic surgeons do do a lot of breast surgery and they do a lot of cosmetic breast surgery. That's that's a big part of what we do. I probably see. I, maybe not more than average, but certainly I would, I'm, I'm a woman in my 40s, you know, and I think a lot of the patient population who come for these sort of surgeries would be see a lot of similarities between me and them. And I think that actually facilitates a discussion because, like you say, a lot of people are hesitant about it or worried about talking about it or may even have been dismissed in the past when they've approached a medic to discuss an issue they may have around their bodies, be it their breasts or tummy or whatever bit of them it is. So I think, you know, I may seem a little more approachable than, than and, and my female colleagues similarly, may seem a little more approachable than the kind of the what a lot of people have in their head as a surgeon is an older man, you know, grey haired and, and very sort of unapproachable. And I think that's one of the reasons I kind of have an Instagram page. Not that I'm hugely active, I'm not, nothing compared to you, but the odd time I, I, I post stuff up there. But it's to kind of create an accessibility there. Um, and I do do a lot of breast surgery. I do a lot of breast reduction surgery. Um, Irish women come in all shapes and sizes, um, but the kind of phenotype of people who are not very tall have quite big breasts and breasts which are disproportionately large compared to the frame. is It's a very common body type in this country. Um, and women have significant issues in terms of symptoms related to their, their breast size. So the common things that people come and tell me, and I have a checklist actually on my consultation form of a specific checklist for, or a specific consultation form I use for this because I see so many patients for this surgery. And I say to the patients as I go through the checklist, I'll say to them, I have a checklist here because a lot of the time women feel like they're the only people or maybe they're over exaggerating it or they're giving their symptoms more um, weight, not to use a pun, but more kind of that they are being a bit silly okay. or something. And there's this whole thing, which is they're really not. So so the, the symptoms people have are physical, they're mental, they're physiological um, and People talk about, you know, difficulty finding clothing that fits, you know, the impossibility of getting a bra that fits well, upper back and neck pain, you know, pins and needles in their arms, um, limiting their ability to their exercise, changing their exercise habits. So these women who might have played loads camogie or football or love running or Irish dancing when they were younger, um, when they started to develop breasts and their breasts got bigger and got heavier and they became self-conscious about them or it just became too uncomfortable, they stopped exercising, which feeds into a whole bit about female health, which I know you're really interested in, but that women don't, women tend to, when you look at the studies of like growing up in Ireland and so on, the, the amount of physical activity that our kids do tends to really fall off in girls in their teens. And this, is, I think, is one of the reasons that self-consciousness 
discomfort. And for a long time in this I country, people were weird about that. breasts. Yeah, no, it is. Like the number of times that people say, I used to be really sporty, I used to love doing X, Y and Z, I can't do it anymore. They don't like to swim because you can't get a swimsuit that fits them well. And when you're in a swimsuit, there's no covering up what's there um, because it's a, obviously it's a tightly fitted garment. You have people saying they wear two bras. They get And then the people tell me they get chafing. They get cuts between their breasts, under the breasts, around the sides because they have to wear such tight underwear. And I would have seen in the pharmacy as well, women with fungal infections yeah. under the breasts, particularly when they're very large breasts, they could literally peel their breast up from yeah. their lower stomach up yeah. to show really macerated skin. Awful. And it's very difficult to get rid of that because like, where does that boob go? You exactly. Know, you can't swing it over your shoulder. No. And y- y- you know that the, the people are, you know, calcium powder everywhere yeah. and, and these sort of symptoms. So it, they're very, th- and then there's the, you know, just buying clothes that fit. So like you might have quite a slim person, somebody with a normal BMI or not, you know, kind of BMI of 26, 27, but they're wearing a much bigger size on top than they are on the bottom. So they can't go and just buy a dress in wherever pennies. And it's some the things that people come back to say and say to me afterwards are um, like, I was able to go into pennies and buy a dress. I, you know, was able to buy a dress that has buttons down the front. I could wear a halter neck. Um, and, and people spend a lot less time, a lot less time thinking about their bodies following surgery because they just don't have to worry about it. And actually, I think I see this all the time that when a woman decides she's going to have surgery and she's made that decision, um, in that period of time between making the decision and having the surgery, she lets all the things that she wasn't let get to her, get to her. Because it's kind of a self-defense thing that people say, I can't say, you know, I can't acknowledge to myself almost that when I get out of the shower, I have to hold my breath, so that bothers me. When I walk down the stairs in my house, I can't walk down the stairs comfortably without putting on a brow, whatever it is. And so in those few weeks between deciding to have surgery and a date in the diary, they kind of let all these things in because they know they're going to be rid of it. And then afterwards, they come back to me at six weeks post-op. And honestly, and I say this to the patients, they're like, they're my favourite appointments. People who are six weeks post-breast reduction are, they walk in and they just, they're walking taller, they're walking straighter. They feel so good already, even if they're, you know, they're nowhere near their final shape because the shape takes time to, t- to kind of settle. But they already feel that smaller, lighter breasts, their clothing is easier. I've even had people say to me, with the nice weather we had earlier this summer, in the first, you know, and that kind of coincided with their early post-op phase going, it was so amazing in the hot weather. I wasn't all sweaty and rashes and all this sort of oh, stuff. That's amazing. And you said something earlier as well. You said that we had such, we had such an issue with breasts in this country too, like the Catholic Church and, <sighs> the t- you know, covering up boobs and boobs as sexualized organs yeah. rather than breastfeeding organs, I suppose. You know, that kind of way. Yeah. So, and all of these things that we have about boobs. So women with larger boobs can be embarrassed about them certainly as teenagers like I remember girls I went to school with that would have developed a lot quicker I was called Mulvaney two backs when I was in school <laughs> the bitches absolute bitches I didn't develop until I was about 17 so I literally had two backs so I'm the opposite but um, but and girls that developed really quickly and they would have been really self-conscious like you could tell always walking around with their uh, with their hands crossing their chest and you can actually you can notice it with little young girls now as well yeah. like walking down from the Lewis the big and baggy jumpers and yeah. yeah and they look women look a lot bigger when they have big boobs even though like I just say yourself they could have a smaller frame oh they do and that's one of the one of the things post-operatively like people don't say to well some people do say you've ha- have you had a breast reduction but the commoner thing that's said to people is you've lost a load of weight and in fact they may have lost you know 500 grams from each breast they might have lost a kilo but in terms of the proportion of their body um, it looks way more. And so it, it's that restoration of proportion and balance um, that, that is achieved from, from the procedure. And it's really, um, you know, I think I, the, the, for younger patients in particular, it's, I, I can't imagine what it must be like being a teenage girl with Instagram and all that imagery around and this sort of thing. Because like when, th- that wasn't something we had to grow up with. We were yeah. a similar age. And, you know, there were bigger people and smaller people. It's a memory in your, 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 um, it's a memory in your head. It's now every night out is documented and every this and every that. And so that picture of like the top that was just a little bit too much, you know, or that they feel is a little bit too much. It's everywhere now. So I think it limits people going out. And um, I think it, when I was training, which is not that long ago, um, but I remember distinctly sitting in outpatients being told by the surgeons who were training me, who were good people, but saying, you know, we advise people to wait till they've had their family before they have this surgery done. <gasps> Um, and that would be reflection. Sometimes, sometimes I'll see an older patient who, at some younger point, went to see her GP and was advised against interfering with her breasts, um, because it is an operation that can interfere with your ability to breastfeed. 
And that's something I counsel people really strongly on. I'm, you know, I breastfed my son for a long time. I was one of those extended breastfeeders, which I think gave me a whole other kind of appreciation of my own body and what yeah. I could do and and, uh, and how amazing it is. Um, but I think there's the, the that weight of opinion that society has around women's bodies um, and what you're supposed to feel about your body and what you're supposed to do with it at a particular point in time, whether it's, you know, when you're supposed to be young and gorgeous or when you're supposed to be breastfeeding or not breastfeeding or all the stuff that goes around that. Um, and then, you know, wanting and seeking surgery. And it's all this pressure back onto patients where they feel like they're being vacuous or vain or superficial or silly for seeking surgeries. And one of the things I say to people all the time is, look, if you needed a knee replacement done or a hip replacement done because you have bad arthritis um, and an orthopaedic surgeon advised you that you were a suitable candidate, would you have the operation done? And they say, yes, well, of course I would. And then I... Po- point out to the patients that we've lots of evidence, evidence, lots of articles that have been written showing that the improvements in quality of life you get from having a breast reduction are equivalent to having a major joint arthroplasty. In other words, having your knee replaced or having your hip replaced um, if you need it. And patients love that because immediately that makes them feel, look, I'm not being silly or vacuous, whatever label, mm. whatever negative label probably they've put themselves for even wanting this operation in the first place. And it's really important that people understand that it, it's not... Um, a purely cosmetic procedure. It has very significant impact on people's quality of life um, and allows them exercise more freely. People go back and, you know, can wear a sports bra comfortably, you know, can go and do exercise, can do impact type exercise. Um, yeah, because like even any kind of like jumping around their boobs, there's no bra that can keep massive boobies in check. So, and even the pain of that on your yeah, back. Yeah, yeah. And the huge like divots, the dips in the shoulders, all these things that people report are all, that's often what patients will actually look at in their post, their pictures afterwards, say, gosh, look at my shoulders and that one from the one that was taken before. Um, and like my focus is usually on the breast, but you do see it in the post-op photos, that's kind of real dip in that people have from the breast wraps is, is, has started to ease out. So, you know, it's, it's something that, it's not for everybody. And like any procedure, people need to understand the risks, the benefits, the consequences, the potential outcomes, where somebody hasn't had her family and thinks that she might want to breastfeed that's a big piece um because if somebody really wants to breastfeed or thinks that she might want to it it, it may reduce somebody's ability to exclusively breastfeed mm. so they may have to supplement her top up but what i always say in that situation is look if and when you get to that point in your life um what you do is you go and see a lactation consultant you go and see a really good lactation consultant when you're still pregnant um and they will ha- be able to guide you and optimize your chances of, of being able to feed your baby yourself um, you know maybe not exclusively but you know there's Facebook groups on you know breastfeeding after reduction this sort of stuff so there is information out there but it, it is one piece that I suppose as somebody who breastfed herself and I know if, so, if you'd said to me in my early 20s are you going to do that I would have been it was so far away from my existence I had no plan to have kids at that stage um, I wouldn't have kind of given it any import. And I sometimes, you know, when I'm talking to the younger patients, I'm like, you really need to know this. And they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, but it's not up to me. It's not yeah. up to me to put my values or my experience or anything on people. Yeah. It's really complicated. Um, the complex, the complexity of their lives and the bits that come into it, it's one piece of the jigsaw. So nothing's without a compromise. Nothing's without a price. And if somebody says, look, that's fine. I understand that. But there's enough going on otherwise that I'm prepared to take that decision myself, then all I can do is make sure that my patients have the best possible information so they can make the decision. And that's a very important part of the kind of counselling process that we have beforehand. Okay. And you just said there you can sometimes take a kilogram off of each boob. Yeah. That's a huge weight that someone is carrying around. Oh, massive. And from a biomechanical point of view, so in terms of the stress in your skeleton, like a, a kilo on top of your head um, versus a kilo out front. A kilo out front is three to four times. So it's like having an extra three to four kilos on your skeleton. So it, it, because it's the way it's carried and pulls you forward. So it's, it's actually got, caused quite a lot of neck pain. And sometimes people will even say to me the following morning, so I'm going, going on Saturday morning to discharge patients, and they'll say to me, oh my God, like my neck, and it just feels better already. Oh my goodness. Now, which I don't promise people because it doesn't happen every time. And, yeah. you know, pain is complex. And if somebody's gotten into bad postural habits and has tight muscles and stuff, but it does sometimes happen that people go, the pain just went away and never came back. Wow. Which is brilliant, you know, yeah. 
because then no matter what else happens in the post-operative period, you know, they have to deal with dressings and stuff, they still already can feel the benefits of it, which is massive. That's wonderful. Do you, does it leave much scarring doing, doing the operation? As in, is it, would it be visible to someone that someone has had a breast reduction or can you do it without scarring? No, there's quite, there's quite a lot of scarring. Okay. Um, and honestly, patients don't care mm. how much scarring there is. So the typical scarring is, so, so one thing that people actually ask me all the time, and I can clarify point of public information, People come and say, I don't know if I need a reduction or a lift. By definition, a breast reduction always includes a lift. Because this is something that I get asked again and again. I don't know which I need. That so, was a question. Yeah, that I, bet, I was going to say, I bet you it's one of yeah. the questions you have. Um, so there's always a lift. So essentially what, what, what a breast reduction involves is reduction of the areola. So the pinky, browny t- skin that surrounds the nipple. That circle is made smaller. And there's a scar that goes all the way around that. Okay. So typically maybe about four centimetres in diameter, the circle that you're left with. And then a scar runs from the six o'clock position in the nipple on the, of the areola down to the fold underneath the breast. Okay, so around and down. And sometimes um, that's all you need, uh, just that lollipop type scar. That's for a smaller reduction. Um, and some surgeons do more of those than others. Shun Murphy, who's a colleague of mine in Black Rock, um, who's a great plastic surgeon, she does a lot of vertical scar reductions, probably more than I do. Um, and that's mad the way you all of your own little things, isn't it? Yeah, it's uh, look, that's the thing. There is a there is a like what works in my hands element to it. I would I most of the breast reductions I do are an anchor shape shaped scar. So and I'll say this to patients in consultations, and they're kind of astonished that I mentioned another surgeon. But like you know, you got to do your research. We recommend people see more than one person. I would never mention a colleague who who I don't ask, you know, hold in very high esteem. So, so scar around the nipple, scar that goes underneath and then a scar that runs underneath. I tell people to imagine that underneath scar as being where an underwire would be. So it's basically what that so full length. where the boob kind of flops over. It's not really seen, is it? Yes, yeah, so exactly. Because place then post the operation over exactly. time. Exactly. Precisely. So it runs in the, in what we call the inframammary fold, the fold where the breast meets the chest wall. <laughs> I have a matsy brain, so yeah. I'm like thinking of the geometry of it all. And it has to fall down over it. I'll, it I'll draw you a diagram <laughs> of how it all comes together. But it, it, it's all, it's all, so it all sort of, and then we, the, the other misconception about the surgery is that the nipple's detached during the surgery. So it's not. So, so because there's a scar all the way around, I can see why that comes through. And very occasionally, um, the nipple is detached and grafted back on, but that's really rare, um, as in I've never had to do one. Okay. Um, so, what we do is we form a stalk of tissue called the pedicle. Um, and at the top of that is the nipple and the areola. So we kind of, that's the first bit we kind of dissect out at the beginning of the procedure. And then we wrap the rest of the tissue around it. Um, and there's particular patterns that we use um, in terms of what, what we remove in terms of the tissue. So, so that's Just stalk tissue. For anyone tissue. who's only listening and not watching, which is the vast majority of you, <laughs> Ailish is doing loads of hand movements here, <laughs> so I'm not even going to try. I don't. I don't and, know. And do a running commentary, but her lovely little hands, and I, I'm, I will actually even said to her there. I always look at surgeons' hands and think, oh my goodness, the magic work that they do. But you've you've lovely small delicate hands, and I can only imagine you know all the cutting and all the sewing and everything that they do. Well, one of my first bosses actually um, in plastic surgery told me my hands were too small to do breast reductions. <laughs> Why on earth? Would okay, you say so, that? so so at the okay, it, remember the patients were asleep. Um, but at the beginning of the operation, you you have to kind of squeeze the breast from its base. So you're kind of holding, making a circle with your hands as big as they are to kind of squeeze it. So you're keeping the skin under a little bit of tension while you're making some of the initial incisions. Okay, and so when you're the assistant, this is your job. You have to like put the, your hands around the circumference, the base of the breast, and squeeze. And and I must have been helping him with somebody who'd need had quite large breasts that my hands couldn't quite make it all the way around the breast and he said you know your hands are too small to be a oh plastic surgeon <laughs> anyway I proved him wrong you did <laughs> look at you so so <laughs> yeah send in this podcast oh well you know he's a very he's wonderful mentor oh, no he's not dead nice. <laughs> sorry <gasps> my okay. god you're so bold oh, I don't know I don't know <laughs> I assumed he was one of those grey-haired men you were talking about earlier. You know, really eternal, eternally youthful. Okay, eternally fantastic. youthful. Doing plastic surgery on himself then cl- cl- clearly he's eternally youthful. Um, okay, so, so we've established that your hands aren't too small and they're lovely, delicate, <laughs> beautiful hands. Yeah. So, so we were talking about anchor scars. So, sorry, yeah. can I ask you why do you do an anchor scar and why would shoe and do a different type of scar? Is it just the way you like to do it? Yeah, like I think um, from any any. For, for, I think if either of us was removing a kilo of breast from each 
each or a kilo of tissue from each breast, we will be using an anchor type, sh- okay. type scar. It's just, I suppose it's a level of comfort with the procedure. There's more than one way you can do it. Okay. And, yeah. and one of my kind of principles that I work off is, no matter what I'm doing, is minimising my variables. So obviously you look at it, each individual's anatomy and you... Um, you will mark somebody up according to that. In other words, all those drawings you see, you know, surgeons drawing, that's all based on somebody's individual anatomy. But we all have our preferences in terms of suture material, the sequence in which we do the surgery. We make very little bit between that. So I tend to try and minimise my variables because I think the fewer things which are you do differently, the fewer potential points of failure there are. So I will do things in the same sequence. I, I typically will always start with the larger breast. You know, I, I have all these things that I do the same each time because then it's not that you're doing it on autopilot, like you're obviously always concentrating on what you're doing. But I know in my hands how I can conceptualise the operation and how I can shape tissue. I know that I tend to prefer the results that I get when I do an anchor type s- scar. But having okay. said that, so like Shun has had the benefit of going to see this amazing surgeon called Betsy Hall Finley who's a Canadian surgeon um, who's described she's she's brilliant she's she's so you'd like her um, she's so straightforward in how she talks about stuff I've seen her presenting at meetings and she says things you know you're at a meeting some mum surgeon be saying hey, well, you know suture the parenchyma of the breast blah 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 and she'll go you stitch the white stuff to the white stuff <laughs> you know, so she's really straight down the line. But she's she has d- described this technique. She's kind of invented this specific way of doing the operation. June has had the opportunity to go and work with her or to do her course. She has a specific course um, that she and I'm going to do that same course next year. So she's okay. been like one on one with her. So maybe by, you know, this time next year, I'll have gone to Canada and spent a few days with her and, and seen a bit and got my head around the bits, which I right now I cope with by doing the anchor scar. And That's amazing so though, isn't it? I love that, that there's different ways to do things. Like there's yeah. more than one way to skin a cat, obviously. Yeah, exactly. And, and that, that people have their own techniques and they stick to them because they know that that's the best outcome that they have for their patients. Yeah. yeah. It's wonderful, actually. But, like, you know, you see that all the way through. Yeah. So as a trainee, when you're training as a surgeon, so you work with different consultants and... The classic one would be the suture material that you use to close a wound. And there's different types of stitch, obviously. So you've got dissolving stitches, which we always use on the inside. Um, and then you've stitches for the outside, which some people like removable stitches. Sometimes people like dissolving stitches. Sometimes people do a running stitch. Some people interrupted stitches, which is individual stitches, kind of classic thing. And we all have our way of doing it. Um, and we all have the way that we like best. When I do my suturing, I do, I stitch wounds in a particular way. But when you're a trainee, you know, you're saying, oh, well, Mr. X likes to close his wounds this way, so I have to do it for this person that way when I'm, it's one of his patients and I, Ms. Y likes that, so you have to do it that way when I'm doing one of hers. And so I suppose as a trainee, you get used to trying these out and then you get to know what you like doing yourself. Um, and then from that, I suppose, from that to say, right, well, th- I'm going to keep that bit and I'm going to keep that bit. And so as you go through, you kind of pick up the bits you like um, because there are these little individual variations. And some, yeah. like you'd work with some, some sort of, I never use that, it's, terrible suture it's dreadful I don't like it at all and somebody else says that's the only one I want you using on my patients you know so there are there are individual experiences that you just kind of take them out of it so it's people think it's like you stitch it the same way no you don't you know it's wow that's yeah it's amazing to think I never even thought of that that element of it and what made you want to get into plastic surgery in the first instance um well I suppose kind of in terms of personality traits (laughs) So we were talking a little bit about um, sort of maths and, and, and stuff like that. I would be, you know, the way they make you do those aptitude tests in school. Yeah. So like 3D reasoning, like 99%, okay. 99th centile, all those. So I was very, I, I am sort of a mathematical person. I also have kind of an artistic side to me. And my family is like that. Like my, my parents are both architects. So it's all, I, I kind of sometimes say like, this is the closest you can get to being an architect while being a doctor. Because oh, yeah. um, it's like, you know, conceptualizing things in 3D and stuff like that. So th- I suppose there's a bit of a kind of a brain that works that way. Um, and then in terms of like your intern years, so the first year after you finish um, and graduate as a doctor, you do six months of surgery, six months of medicine. I was pretty sure I wanted to be a surgeon. I liked the cut and thrust of it. Um, and I worked with, the job I did was cardiothoracics um, and in there was it was more it was just thoracics really the job I did but I, I got to go to theatre as and then you know the, the consultant I worked with so I said well do that and 
hand me the scalpel. And I was like, wow. Okay. And I just totally bitten by the bug. And, and, and I love the immediacy of it. And then another job I did was neurology, um, which was intellectually fascinating. So looking at, you know, making a diagnosis, figuring out where something had gone wrong in terms of the patient's symptoms, like where they might have had the stroke or which artery, you know, which bit of the brain. But I found there was there was no kind of quick fix to that. And I am a kind of a, right, well, that that's broken. The thing about surgery and particularly the sort of surgery you're doing um, earlier on, you know, where there's trauma and stuff like that, you're like, well, that's cut and I sew it back together and then it's fixed. You can see, you can see the kind of outcome of your work very immediately so I liked the immediacy of it I, I like doing stuff with my hands I'm kind of I would have you know made jewellery as a hobby and painted and you know needlework in school I was always you know quite good in the old embroidery and all that sort of stuff so I, I, I am somebody who likes to physically do things okay. with my hands so I, I would have done that and I thought you know okay well I'm interested in surgery and so I went and did what's called my basic surgical training um, and that was in Tala Hospital and um the first job I did was in vascular surgery. And actually, it's it's funny you asked me this. I just got an email earlier today to say one of the consultants who I worked with, Sean Tierney, died last week. And he was an incredible role model. He was a young man. Um, he wasn't even 60. Um, and oh yeah, sick? Yeah. Um, oh and, you know, I just got that. And, you know, just got that today. And he was he was incredible. He was an incredible mentor. Um, he was a full-on feminist. He never didn't even see somebody being a woman or a man, it was just, you had an aptitude. And actually he had, um, he had sent an email when I, I finished my two years of basic surgical training, didn't do any plastic surgery in that, but he was the person who emailed my first boss in plastic surgery to say, Eilish thinks she wants to be a plastic surgeon. Will you meet her and talk to her and, you know, basically encourage. And I got I, my, my first job in plastic surgery, really on foot of a letter that this man wrote. Um, and he was just a brilliant educationalist and he was a huge advocate and um, for just kind of pushing on and he would kind of keep the pressure on you to keep working, but not in a bad way. And he was, he'd be sorely missed. He was a, a really remarkable man, Sean Tierney. He was so um, just funny that you asked me about oh, this I'm today by to coincidence. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, you know, it's, it's not, it's not my, it's not my sorrow. It's not my loss and his family, obviously, I'm, yeah. you know, huge sympathy for them, but it was because of the encouragement of really good mentors like that. Um, the other surgeon who worked with him was a vascular surgeon who was known for being quite gruff, but he looked down at, I had stitched up somebody's leg after taking a vein graft to do thing. And he looked down and he said, Jesus, I'd let you sew up my leg. And I thought, okay, I can do this. So, um, so it was kind of that, that, it's that, that thing. It's a little bit of encouragement that yeah. you need, isn't it? Yeah, totally. And so, so, so I kind of went through that and I did vascular and I did general surgery and I did orthopaedics and, and the bits that I liked from those specialties um, kind of added up to plastic. So I liked, you know, sewing up skins would look really nice. So you'd have other, be, you know, some big bowel surgery and I'd be like, I'm not really into that bit, but like, can I close the skin and can I stitch up the skin? That's the bit I liked doing. Um, I liked the bit of breast reconstruction we did as part of breast surgery. I liked the hands that we did as part of orthopaedics and all of those things are things that sort of, and I like the minor ops, the small skin lesions that we would have done as general surgical SHOs. So all of those bits sort of added together to kind of go, maybe I should be a plastic surgeon. So that's kind of how I found my way to, I knew I wanted to do surgery. I liked the operations and then I kind of went and then I did a job for a year um, in plastics and that was that. I was like, right, mm. this is for me. So that's kind of how I found my way into it. And was it a very long, hard slog? Like you always hear surgery is particularly gruesome, literally as in, you know, the hours, the the length of time it takes to train. By the time you're trained, you're generally, you know, in your late 30s, early 40s. Yeah. So it's, you really need to be in in, in for the long haul, don't you? Yeah, like I, I graduated in 2001 um, and I started my practice in 2014. As a, so I started as a consultant in 2014. Okay. So in that time I did my basic surgical training, kind of a, my first job in plastics, did a master's in surgery, did the higher surgical training scheme in plastic surgery, um, which is a six-year program, um, which you need to get onto that training scheme. I took a year out from that to do a master's in sports medicine because I was kind of interested in it. And okay. I was, I was, the training's pretty arduous and I was like, I, I just wanted to step back, but I didn't want to step away at that 
time I was kind of thinking more going down the hand surgery route so I said I can do sports medicine so I did that had a blast <laughs> it was a great year why? because I, I didn't have to do it it was just there because I was really interested okay. I was really interested so I was really, like the really annoying older person in the class going I have a question and they were like come on I do want to go to the pub so, okay. <laughs> so I asked lots of questions um, but it was and really, what is sports medicine what's the difference then so it was like sports and exercise medicine it's a totally different specialty so it was like my class was mostly physios they're mostly 10 years younger than me um, and it's just that's not a bad thing no, it I wasn't. Was out with the young ones. There was the day though where I was talking about Italian ninety, and one of them pointed out to me he was born as a result <laughs> of Italian ninety <laughs> that he was conceived, and I just thought because there was he was talking about some match. He was like, I'm imagining what it'd be like if the Irish team was really good, and I said, Do you not remember Italian ninety? And he just looked at me and said, I was conceived during Italian oh, ninety. And I thought, oh, Jesus. <laughs> yeah, that's when you know you're old. Yeah, yeah, totally. Uh, but it was. Um, so I just I just did it as kind of a bit of space back and there's loads of anatomy and it was really it was just a really good year um, and then I went back and finished my training then I went and did fellowships mostly in the UK and some time in Holland and then I came back here and set up my consultant practice in the Beacon um, okay. and do you work there exclusively mm. okay and are you busy all the time busy yes <laughs> yes okay. I am yes yeah, but you know in a really good way yeah. I think one of the things like. There's a lot of challenges to running a business and what I, there was a very steep learning curve because you're trained to be a doctor, you're trained to be a surgeon, but like you're running a business um, and HR and staff and how to structure things and how to put a value on yourself, which I actually found really at the beginning quite challenging. And I've got totally got my head around that by now, but as being like, oh, I couldn't possibly ask people for money to come and see me and get my opinion. And then you kind of. Now, is that a bit of a female thing, do you think? Yes, totally. Yeah, I think so. But um, I, I've kind of got around that very much so. And 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 you know, you have to put a value on yourself, and you have to decide what you're worth, and you have to know 100%, what you're worth. Hundred percent. Sure. I uh, even myself, I've had a st- that steep learning curve too. But even, mm. um, even with the running the business thing. So I, I launched my business with my nutrition supplements last year, but I tried to do it in 2017 with my pharmacist head only. So my pharmacist head that was brilliant formulator and could get like a really good product. Yeah. But like like any of the financial stuff and everything was like totally over my head. And I totally failed at the first like I didn't even get the stuff made initially really? because it was just I was so green with that. But then I like took some time out, learnt all those processes and then went back. But it's definitely a steep learning curve. But the putting yeah. the value in yourself, I think, is a very much a female thing. Like even yeah. when I'm you know, when you're asked to speak at events, like I do loads of pro bono events, but then there's yeah. other events that you're asked to speak at and stuff and you know, I remember like thinking like, God, I couldn't possibly charge this amount or that amount and you know that kind of way. But it is that learning curve and Yeah, but you you know, who else is going to put a value on you if you don't well, put it on yourself? Yeah. And I think you have to, it's definitely, a, 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 I definitely think it's to do with being a woman and it's this constant thing of you have to be nice the whole time. You can't possibly be saying, you know, well, actually, the, my time is worth this if you want my opinion. And it sounds really hard-nosed, but at the end of the day, if, if you can't run as a business, if you can't run a business, I'm not going to be there at all. Well, that's the thing. You, you know, can't but run it. You, know, you can't run it if you're not making money or you're not, you know, you, you know, can't put the money back into actually making the business work. Isn't that right? Yeah, well, I, I have to charge for consultations because mm-hmm. I have to pay for the room that you're in. I have to pay my secretary who made your appointment and I have to do this and I have to, you have to pay for all those things. And it sounds awfully mercenary. And I think... I think there's a bit of a thing with doctors as well. I don't think it's maybe just entirely about being a woman, but I think doctors, um, quite rightly, we you know feel like they have to. Um, you, you can't you can't withhold care. You could never withhold care, and of course yeah. that's not something you would ever do. Um, but I think getting your head around and being okay with wanting to have a profitable business mm-hmm. and that not being a bad thing. Um, and saying, no, we are going to set up, we're going to have a really good offering, we're going to have, you know, look after our patients, we're going to make sure things are as, as they should be, that we have safe processes in place, that we have all those things. And once you do that, then you, you, you're, you like anybody else, you're entitled to make a living. Um, and you will get people who um, find fault with that. Um, you know, what can you do? I know, you just deal with the people that don't find fault with it, I suppose. Yeah. You know what I mean, you, you, you can only be the best that you can be and then I suppose there's always yeah. going to be some people that disagree with you, isn't there? Yeah. Well, I think the thing is, like, uh, healthcare is expensive and it's it's always paid for, but it's a question of who's who's paying. Um, and I think, you know, there is a thing around, um, in this country, people who hold health insurance, I think there's a complexity there that people feel their health insurance should cover, for example, 
outpatient appointments. And, you know, when people phone and they book an appointment and they're told, OK, you have to pay for your appointment and this is the, this is the fee, and people say, no, my insurance will cover it. And I think there is, unfortunately, the, the, it can be the case when people are buying an insurance policy that isn't very clear to them mm. that they will have to pay all their outpatient costs up front. And that's really universal. And people say, no, well, that's because the insurance policy comes in and it's like a 12 page document. And I don't want to read that. So no. even just reading the fine print is to know what you look at. I don't know what I'm entitled to with my policy, yeah. to be honest with you. And, it, you know, particularly young, well, people who don't have a lot of time, you know, don't spend a lot of time interacting. Saying, well, no, I've got really good insurance. That'll be covered. And you're like, no, you have to pay and claim it back. And I think it falls on the doctor's office a lot of time to explain it's those processes to people. But again, you know, that's the thing is healthcare costs money. So your insurer is going to cover it with the, you know, you, you know, treatment in the public system is just as expensive. You just don't see it. Can people get breast reductions on in the public system? Or what do they, do I they think need to have certain criteria that there are ticked? Yeah, so there are, there are criteria. Um, in the public system, I don't know how many are, you can, but I don't know how many are happening because the system is under such huge pressure and the waiting lists are off the wall. Um, but, in terms of insurance, the, there's differences between the health insurance companies, but they do have criteria. Um, and if they are met, there, it's, it's what's called a prior approval process. So what happens is I have to write to the health insurance company and um, outline, basically argue the patient's case um, and say, you know, get prior approval for the, the procedure to be covered. And is, that the, is that your favourite part of your job? Yeah, can you tell? <laughs> So it can be very straightforward. Arduous or, 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 Well, it's do you know what it's it, it can be like for for most of them. It, there's a there's an upper limit on the body mass index or BMI. So whether it's twenty seven or twenty seven point five, that varies from insurer to insurer. Upper back and neck pain. Um, when you say upper limit, do you mean that they can't have the surgery if they're over? A yes. Weight? Yeah. And why would that be? Well. <sighs> From an insurance point of view, it used to be an upper limit of 25 for most of them, which was, you know, that's so long if you're, you know, that's that's, that's very low. High. It's not high. There, My limit for, for anybody is a, an upper limit of 28, which is not particularly high. But the reason I have that is the evidence shows that the rate of complications from surgery bounces above that level. Okay. So there's a significantly higher risk of complications from surgery. So DVTs of blood clots, which can travel up to your lungs and cause a pulmonary embolus, the risk of hematoma or bleeding, um, fat necrosis, which is where some of the fat inside the breast can die and does often form a hard lump or an oily cyst. So the risk of complications jumps um, once you're at a BMI of about 28. So that's my upper limit in terms of sort of from a medical point of view. And would you encourage people then to lose weight before they go into the surgery? Would that be, like just say they are yeah. on that upper limit, they're, they're yeah. above that upper limit. Have you seen people try to lose weight to get the surgery or even like get the weight loss injections or, you know, those kinds of things? Is that happening? It is. Yeah, it is. And I think one of the things, the misperception that sometimes people come back and say, look, my breasts aren't going to get any smaller if I lose weight. I know they're going to. And we know that it's okay. nothing to do with thinking your breasts are going to shrink and go away if you lose weight. It's to do with surgical safety. OK. Um, and that's that's the kind of the, the, the whole point is, is that... Um, you know, it's it's to do every operation as safely as possible. So, so for the insurance companies will say a cup size of F or more, upper back and neck pain, BMI of twenty seven point five. Some of them have criteria around rashes, and um, like we were talking about, some of them have criteria around um, the position of the nipple in relation to the fold and stuff like that. So it depends which so insurance if company. So, the cup size is. is more than an F, you couldn't operate. No, you can. Oh, you can. You need to be more than an All F. Right. Okay. Um, but. You know, bra cup size is, um, it's very arbitrary. It it's, is. It's, a, it's, a, it's an arbitrary measurement, um, you know, and it depends on who's measuring sure you I and the brand. I for years was like a 38, 38 um, A cup when actually I went to get it properly checked. In contour, they told me about you. <laughs> and I was like, you're like, no, actually, you're like a 34 to be, C. To be clear. You're, you've been wearing the wrong bra forever. <laughs> I was in there and I had this wonderful chat. I was in there quite yeah. recently and we were talking about you. <laughs> Because <laughs> we're like, she said something. So I don't know, because you know how it is, and it's such, it's such a kind of kind of special space. That place has been there since I was a kid. I like know, I grew up on Black Rock, and I remember okay. walking past, and my dad being like, "Do you want to go there?" I'm like joking, and me being like mortified, yeah, going, yeah, "Dad, yeah. don't point out the brass on the window." You know, he was just <laughs> taking the mic, um, and so I went in there, and it was like, 
it was such a nice experience. Oh, the lovely. women are amazing. Yeah, they're amazing. Um, and so anyway, then she I got chatting and she was, I don't know what, she, I, was, I was saying to her, it was quite entertaining to me that the focus was on my boobs for once. Because it's always, <laughs> and, she, and then, see, this is what I was talking about at the beginning about the way I talk about boobs in normal conversation. Oh, yeah. So it was like, it's, and then she was sort of looking at me and then I felt I had to explain myself. So then okay. we had this whole conversation about measuring people for yeah. bras and how cup size is really arbitrary and yeah. um, all that sort of stuff. So, so I have actually been invited to come back um, for a tutorial on how to actually measure people for bras. I'm not oh. sure when I'm going to manage that, but it was, but then they, they I don't know, they said that, oh, they, they mentioned to the fabulous pharmacist had, oh. had given them a shout out. <laughs> oh, that was it. So you had people, mentioned it on yeah, the podcast. Because, because, um, because people had messaged me and asked who's the best bra fitter. They wanted a, a decent bra fitter in Dublin. And I knew Contour had totally sorted me out. But then when I put a question box up, so many people said the same thing. They, they gave other yeah. names of other of other great businesses too. Yeah. Well, Contour was kind of the standout one. But like, yeah, I've been going around for years in the wrong cup. So I think yeah, that's why I say it's really arbitrary, isn't it? Absolutely. So could you lie like and pretend that someone was, you know, an F and they're really like I mean, an E? Like, <laughs> I, whatever the patient tells me she is when she okay. comes in. Note to everyone, you're an F, okay? You're At an F. least an F. At least an F. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's talk boob um, augmentations. Okay. So someone asked about that uh, breast implant disease. Breast I, impl- implant illness. A breast implant yeah. disease. Do you hear me? Yeah, like, no, no. Oh. But the, yeah. So, so what is that? How common is it? Would you be worried and concerned? And how many breast implants do you do? Okay. So, wow, that's a lot of questions. I know, yeah. We'll be um, here all day. So two things. So there, there are two entities um, which both kind of came into public consciousness around the same time. And they're two really different things. Um, there's breast implant illness and then there's breast implant associated lymphoma. Okay. And they're two entirely separate things, but they did sort of, they, they did sort of arise around the same time. So just dealing first with breast implant associated lymphoma, it's a very definite disease. It is a lymphoma, which is a type of blood cancer and it can arise in the capsule or the tissue. Your body will form a scar around a breast implant and it can arise in that tissue. Um, and it is something that, you know, arises seven to nine years following surgery, usually presents as a sudden onset um, of swelling in the breast, so in what's called a seroma or collection of fluid. Most of the time, if somebody notices a seroma and they get a collection of fluid around their, their breast implant, it is a benign thing, but it can represent this. It was associated particularly with um, very aggressively textured, so rough surfaced implants. Um, and those particular implants have been um, withdrawn from the market, actually, and why would they have had ago. aggressively surfaced implants in the first instance? So they implants all have a silicone shell on them and they can either be smooth walled um, or they can be rough. And the, the, there were a couple of reasons for the rough or textured implants. One was that allowed us to have teardrop shape implants. So an, a breast implant can either be round so it looks like it's part of a sphere Mm. Um, or it can be a teardrop shaped implant so it's sort of thinner at one end and fuller at the other end so at the bottom kind of more like the shape of a breast naturally so the the texturing meant that the implants were sort of stuck a little bit like velcro to the tissue so it would hold in place so you could have this sort of more fullness at the bottom particularly useful in breast reconstruction where somebody was completely flat and you're trying to give back a breast shape okay. um, and it also was felt and was true that the texturing reduced the risk of capsular contracture, which is where the scar tissue around the implants hardens and tightens and distorts the implant. So that's why we had texturing and it, it served that very well, but we didn't realise at the time that this texturing could cause this other issue. And so we started seeing a few cases and then a few more. how can it cause a cancer? We don't really know. We don't understand fully the mechanism. Yeah. There's a question whether it's related to a biofilm so okay. that is um, a subclinical level of bacterial contamination of the surface of the implant. Um, so, you know, not enough to cause an infection or any symptoms infection, but kind of a chronic irritation sort of situation. So um, the way I sort of explain to people is like if you have somebody who continues to smoke, like the irritation of the cigarette smoke on the airway, that's the, the foreign thing can can cause it. And you can get, you can, it's very rare, but you can get, cancer is associated with any implant um, you know any, anywhere in the body so so that was breast implant associated lymphoma the particular type of implants just because you know that people need to know about it, it will be allergan biocell implants and if somebody has those the advice is not to have them removed you need to continue being breast aware um, and to have your implants to have a breast exam regularly and to talk to your GP if you're worried and get it referred into the breast clinic if you're worried and if you notice 
signs of um, suggestive of a seroma, like a swelling in the breast, you should obviously be, you know, see your GP um, or back to your original surgeon if there's still somebody that you can you can attend. It depends. People have had them done in clinics which have been closed or done abroad or whatever else. And that's one of the key things about having breast implants. You have to be breast aware. And it's not a one and done. If you have a breast implant surgery, you are committed to a lifetime of further surgeries um, and you have to continue being aware of your breasts and minding your breasts. So that is a very separate entity. It's rare um, and it's something, there was a, it actually was all just kind of happened before COVID that there was a sort mm. of information dissemination. There were ads, um, you know, there was a public information campaign kind of via the Department of Health and I stuff. I remember it. Actually, yeah. yeah, and then it was all COVID. And okay. so, because that was all sort of the end of 2019, beginning of 2020, we were doing that. Um, um, you know, that that alertness was there and then obviously just COVID came and just washed everything away. So that 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 is one entity and it's very separate. And... Um, there is a really good on the HPRA website, the Health Products Regulatory Authority. So if anyone's listening to this saying I need to know more about it, because obviously we're going to talk about it in passing on the HPRA website, they have a page specifically talking about this um, with up to date information, up to date advice on it. But to be clear, if you have those type of implants, the advice is to just be breast self aware, continue self examination. Any woman who has breasts, you know, you need to continue being breast aware. Um, and at the end of the day, you know, breast cancer, normal breast cancer is much more common than this condition. So it's just just to kind of, if somebody's looking for further resources and stuff, that's where to look. Okay. The other entity that you mentioned there, breast implant illness, is very different. Um, and it's not, um, it's not been recognised by the WHO as a specific diagnosis. So what I mean by that is everyone's got used to this idea with COVID um, that, you know, basically COVID-19 was recognised as a particular as an illness right it was recognized that these are the diagnostic criteria so you have a positive PCR test that means you have COVID-19 so that defines the illness whereas with breast implant illness we don't have the same number of um, we don't have definite diagnostic criteria for it so when you what what it is is there are some women who have breast implants have symptoms um, which are may be associated with the implants um, and may be relieved by having the implants removed. So when you look at the list of, um, when you look at the list of symptoms, you know, there are things like fatigue, tummy upset, diarrhea, constipation, um, aches and pains, brain fog, you know, all of these things. Sounds a bit like perimenopause. Exactly. So they're all very common symptoms, which if I say to anybody walking down the street, if you say to any woman walking down the street, in the last six months, have you had a day where you had brain fog, <laughs> um, a pain, a pain in your body, yeah. aches, a, a weird, tired? exactly, a <laughs> yeah. weird rash which comes and goes. And like, I, I, you know, so it's really hard to diagnose. Mm. There's no blood test we can do. There's no scan. There's no... So there's no antibodies against the no. The, so there's the no or something. there's no so, diagnostic yeah. criteria, which makes it really hard. Now the the kind of old school patriarchal view would be like, oh, it's all in your head. Women who are tired and they think it's their implants. All that no, like there is definitely something to this. Okay, that's my view. Okay, we don't have strong evidence, but you cannot do like breast sur breast augmentation surgery. Millions of them done worldwide. Very happy patients, generally speaking. You know, but there are definitely some people for whom implants are not right. Okay, mm -hmm. there, there are some people that are not, just not right. Um, and, you know, in Western medicine, we are definitely, it's the, you know, the disconnect between the body and, and, and the brain. So, you know, you'll see this in pharmacy. We have the pharmacology, we've got the reason for everything. Um, but sometimes people, you know, if you have something in your body, which is your, for one reason or another, Think, and I don't mean that in a you're having notions and being silly, but if you feel strongly that this thing is making you sick and it's making you unwell um, and, you know, you develop symptoms which you only got after you had the operation done um, and then you have the implants removed, does it make you feel better? It might well. And it's not that it's all in your head in that old school kind of a way, but there mm. is, I think there's mechanisms, there's pathways there that we don't understand yet. Um, and unfortunately, as doctors, we've no way of preoperatively figuring out who these patients are going to be. Um, so... It's, it's really hard to define. Some people who report those sort of symptoms and they have their implants removed don't feel any better afterwards. Okay. Um, and that's, so 
in terms of us being able to define it, diagnose it, treat it, it's it's almost too nebulous. It's too yeah. slippy. There's also there is some inf- misinformation out there, and there be some people who would listen to me talking to you here and say, "Oh, typical plastic surgeon. She knows about this, and she, you know, they're holding information back, and they make money from doing this operation. They know these implants are poisoning people. If I thought something was poisoning somebody, I would not do it. Yeah. Like end of. I just yeah. wouldn't. Um, and nor would any." nor would any ethical plastic surgeon um, if we had the evidence there. Right now, um, we don't have the evidence to say they're unsafe. All we can do is continue gathering data, which we're doing much better now because prior to the ALCL situation, which I was describing to you, we didn't really have implant registries for implants um, and they've all kind of sprung up around the world and the Irish one is happening Soon, so people were just being given implants, and it wasn't really being noted. What they well, there wasn't. Take. There was no national registry. Okay. People were being given their implant details, and it was being kept as part of their individual hop- hospital record. But there was no national database. So if there was some sort of recall um, for all the patients, even if you know their surgeons had died, retired, moved away, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that for patients to be identified who had a particular potentially problematic implant. Okay. So the thing with breast implant illness is. What I say to cancer people when I'm, when, I'm, when I'm seeing for them for the surgery is I explain, we don't fully understand it. We have no way of knowing who might be impacted. It's possible you could undergo this surgery and you could be somebody who's negatively impacted by having implants. And what kind of percentage of people is, is it? Do you even have a stat? Have we, you seen much of it in your practice? Um, I haven't. Okay. Um, I have seen... So I, it, it, nobody who I've done a surgery for has reported those symptoms. Um but maybe they, maybe they have and they've moved away or something yeah. that I know of. There isn't a stat because in order to collect data, you need to be able to define okay. the illness. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. In order to say how many cases of COVID were there, you looked at the number of positive COVID tests. Do you know what I mean? So yeah, so okay. unless without the without the diagnostic criteria, it's impossible to say there's you know exactly how many cases there are. I encourage my patients who I've done that surgery for to come back and see me for annual review. Um, and, you know, I've not had anyone report symptoms, but it, it could happen. It okay. could happen to anybody. And it's it, it, it's a bit of a mental leap for anyone to have the surgery done. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and it's the same as anything. Um, you know, people have to weigh up for themselves and feel that they have the best information. So what I've said to you there is very similar to what I'll say to people in a consultation in terms of what our level of knowledge is around this at this point in time. Um, but it's, 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 we're going to know more about it in, in years yeah. to come. And as we, as we learn more about it, then we will impart that information to our patients. And, and can, as part of a preoperative counselling process, it's all we can do. And do you do many breast augmentations? I would do way more reductions, actually. Um, I think there's a few reasons for that, um, but I would do a reasonable number. Um, is it th- mainly younger women or older women, or is it every type? My typical patients would be women in the kind of thirties and forties who finished their families and their babies stole their boobs. <laughs> <laughs> literally, <laughs> yeah, literally. So they would be my like the classic person I would see. Yeah. Um, like where, where, where do these tea bag tits come from? <laughs> literally, yeah. Yeah, and the, the the real common thing that people talk about is sort of the upper pole being very empty and, you know, they're not sort of filling a bra and they have that, particularly if they wear like a t-shirt bra, that there's like that hollow, mm. you know, that it sits out and there's, when they lean forward, there's a gap there. So that's the, the kind of classic thing. And people will often say like they liked how their breasts look when their milk came in and they want to kind of go back to that. Yeah. You know, that sort of full... Juicy. Oh sure, I saw a friend of mine. She sent me a picture of herself in France there with her baby. Her baby's about oh, you know, four months old. You know that like where they're literally exclusively breastfed and they're feeding loads. Your boobs are massive, and her boobs are literally bulging out of her top. And I just messaged her. I said there is nothing like breastfeeding boobies, and she's like <laughs> absolutely nothing. She says my boyfriend's delighted with himself. <laughs> I remember when my son was really little, looking down and going. My boob's actually bigger than his head. Oh, no. so, it's so <laughs> Which was funny. quite, quite a, quite a moment, but it was... It's funny, isn't it, when you see those pictures it's and the, wild. Boobs are, they're, the boobies bigger than the head. Uh, we, we did talk before about you would often have like a mother and a daughter almost that come in for the reductions because yeah. it's been in the family and you had granny cheering them on in the background. Yeah, she yeah. was living with these big boobies for her whole life and never got seen to. So this is, can you just tell that? I think that's a lovely story. Yeah. So. Well, I, I have a number of um, kind of mother-daughter pairs who I've done surgery for. So Not at the same time. Not clearly. at the same time. But no, but you, you know, like sometime it, I've had 
both ways, but you know, I maybe operate on um, a woman in maybe her late forties, fifties, um, who then subsequently her daughter is referred in when she's in her twenties looking for a breast reduction, um, or a few times I've had you know operate on a young woman in her twenties, and her mum's there coming to the appointments and stuff and at some point the mum says well if she can have it so can I <laughs> um, you know I've put up with this you know my whole life and um, that because sometimes they're of that age group they, they will have gone to their GP um, and fortunately this doesn't happen very much anymore but you know would have gone to their GP and told them you're fine healthy breasts now you just leave them alone not to be interfering um, and they would have been put off even if they even got as far as exploring the possibility of a okay. referral back in the day and then somewhere in the background you sometimes hear that oh my granny and it's I love hearing it you have these like gorgeous women in their early 20s and they're saying oh my granny thinks I'm great and she's telling me to go for it and she wishes she'd had a chance to do it and that I love female that. behind a female, there's <sighs> nothing like it. Sure, it's incredible. In family in the generations, like it's unreal. Yeah, it's it's and it's so lovely to see and, 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 and to, I think it's a really unique kind of female space that you have that that support that there's just a, there's the lived experience that, that granny has had and um, sometimes they will have told the story of what, the time they went to the GP about it and like we're utterly shamed out of it, you know, yeah. in terms of just like really kind of upsetting to hear that, you know, and so so they're like the biggest advocate <laughs> and cheering Absolutely, them on. It's gorgeous. Yeah. I love it. But your mum and your granny ge- in general, they always want it better for you than they had, don't they? So yeah. it goes without saying that if their body shape and they weren't happy with it, that they'd love their granddaughter to just go and do it. It just makes so much sense. Yeah. Can we talk about um, the abdominal surgeries that you do? Oh, yeah. Too? Because that, that was what... That's actually the first things that I saw on your page too because they looked so interesting and, and I'd like to know the, the type of woman that you do them for and what it entails too. Like what kind of, you know, is it a lot of recovery to for those surgeries? Yeah, so so the, a lot of the tummy tucks I do um, are for women who've got a degree of diastasis um, or a separation of their six pack muscles Um and that's usually in the postpartum scenario. I get a lot of referrals from G- from um, physiotherapists. So women's health physios will often send a patient into me who they've been working on her diastasis. Now, some, some, not all of them, some of them are more a skin and fat issue. But a lot of the time there's a degree or an element of abdominal wall laxity. So you've got abdominoplasty. So abdomen is the, the tummy and plasty means it kind of comes from the word plastic. You're changing the shape. Of it, so so as an abdominal as as an abdominal plastic, there's you're you're addressing the different layers in the tummy wall, so skin, fat, fascia, which is the tissue around the muscle, um, and and they're the layers that you're dealing with. And sometimes the reason that somebody has fullness in their abdomen is related to fat. Sometimes it's related to excess skin. Sometimes it's related to laxity of the fascia. Um, a lot of the time. You've got a cesarean section scar thrown into the mix, which a lot of people have this kind of puckered up scar and it'll overhang or pooch over it, um, which kind of can add the, to the um, to the appearance or the, the concerns. The reason people come to see me about their abdomens is oftentimes it's either functional or aesthetic. So if it's functional, it can be to do with their diastasis, their muscle strength and all that sort of stuff. If it's aesthetic, it's a sticky output. And again, it's 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 the permission to be okay with, um, that it's okay to say, I'm not happy with how my tummy looks. Um, because again, there's this huge pressure of, you know, and it, I think some women actually contribute to this and say, like, your post, love your postpartum body. And great, love your postpartum body. But if you're really bothered by your postpartum body and people keep asking you, going, when's the baby due? When the baby's three, it's okay to be bothered by that mm-hmm. if it's something that bothers you. And it's okay to learn what's involved in a surgery and to contemplate having an operation done. It, it's, it's not a question of not loving and honouring what your body has done. Um, but, you know, you don't necessarily have to... Bear the scars off the for scars, the rest of your life, which nowadays we're living longer and we're, you know, we generally look better in our 40s than our grannies did. Yeah. So but whether that's a societal thing and it's the <laughs> the pressure that's put on us or the pressure that we put on ourselves. But if a woman wants to go and get something done, I don't think that she should be shamed about it. Exactly. Like and it, like anything else, like I was saying, like you learn about the procedure and the consequences and what's involved. And a lot of the time... 
people come to see me all the time. People come to see me about my tummy and I'm like, so do you have any urinary incontinence and back pain? And they go, why are you talking about urinary incontinence? A lot of the time if somebody's got a diastasis or even just a weakness of their abdominal wall, um, it's got a knock on effect on their pelvic floor. Um, and I strongly encourage anyone who's going to have this surgery with me to see a women's health physio. Um, and I know you've you've interviewed a few women's health physios and I'm a massive fan of, I just think it's an incredible job and they're just oh so, my goodness. They're, they're so, so underrated as well. Like, and like the, every woman who has a baby should be given a woman's health physio like they weeks. do in France. Yes, I was going to say you exactly know? like they do in France. Um, it should be part of standard of care. Yeah, but it's not. We're just told to go home and do a few squeezy muscle exercises there yeah. and off you go. Yeah, and if you, you know, you might not even have a vaginal exam if you've had a cesarean birth, yeah. um, which is... It's like you've just carried a baby around in your pelvic floor for the last nine yeah. months, but it didn't come out that way. So nobody even checks, you know. So so there's, there's all those, there's, there's a lot to it. And it's not that this operation will um, cure urinary incontinence or cure back pain, but there are some women who will have a functional benefit from it. So because I've kind of got an interest on it from the functional side, which probably goes a little bit back to my sports medicine thing. Um I get a lot of physios refer. I gave, a, I gave a talk to a bunch of physios about it a number of years ago. So now I'm like, I get, I get, I get, well, not inundated, but I'm happy to see them. And I'm happy to address those. But we we would we'd never say, you know, there's no guarantee that your function will improve following abdominal plastic. And also, diastasis may not necessarily limit somebody's function. People can train to a really high level with a diastasis, so long as they're training right and under the correct supervision, and all that sort of stuff. So there's a whole bit to that. But coming back to sort of the the operation, um, what the operation involves is addressing whatever layer in the abdominal wall um, is causing the protrusion. And it's usually at the front of the tummy. So an abdominoplasty, a classic tummy tuck, addresses the front of the tummy. It doesn't address sort of the love handle area at the side. It doesn't, you know... And oh, it you can't just like... You know, pull it all together. No? Well, well y- y- yes and no. Oh, God, um, tell it, me you can. It depends. <laughs> well, it depends on what the individual anatomy is, but it's most powerful at the front. It's okay. most powerful in the midline at the front. So... The classic incision is, so if somebody has a cesarean scar, the incision is made under that. So a lot of people, most people know what a cesarean scar looks like. So it's like that, but it's much longer. It'll go from hip bone to hip bone. Okay, so it's quite a long scar. And it has to be a long scar because we're usually taking out a lot of skin. And then I lift up the skin right the way up to the rib cage. So in the midline where your two ribs from your right and left side come together into that V that sits almost at the level of, you know, your inframammary fold at the bottom of your breast. I lift it right the way up to there. And what you see then is the the abdominal wall and you may see the gap or separation between the six pack muscles. Okay. Um, And then what we do is we stitch the fascia. So um, the way I kind of explain fascia to people is if you, are you vegetarian by the way? No. No. Okay. So you, you, no. Okay. So so sometimes I just, no. (laughs) Well, I was actually for many years, but not not anymore. No, I was for a year and I, I, it it didn't really suit me. I'd need it my meat. I needed my red meat. So, but, (laughs) so when you're eating the meat, that's the animal's muscle and the white tissue around that is the fascia. It's the sort of grisly connective tissue. So when I'm doing the repair, so if you imagine the six pack is like two pieces of meat, two muscles separated from each other. And a lot of the stuff you read about tummy tucks, they talk about stitching the muscles. You don't stitch the muscles, you stitch the fascia, you stitch that white grisly tissue that surrounds the muscles back together. So you stitch from the rib cage all the way down to the pubic bone. And it's like... um, you know, those corsets you see in like Victorian dresses, yeah. you know, the way it's all laced up the back. Yeah. So that's what you do internally. It's like an internal corset and you gather everything in there. So particularly when yeah, somebody... sounds so artistic. I mean, it's... I so, want to go back. It's so artistic. Be, I want to be a plastic surgeon <laughs> when I grow up. <laughs> it's it's a very satisfying operation to do because you oh see it gathering God, in. So you're, ga- you're, you're, you're basically putting this internal corset in. And so how long does it take you to do that stitching? That's it. That bit? About 10 minutes, I suppose. Really? Well, well like, I would have thought you'd be there for hours, like, you know. No, it's getting there because you have to, like, do the whole dissection. You have to lift up the tissue to let you get to that bit. And then you do that repair and you, like, stitch it all back to it. And it just comes back to where it's supposed to be because it's reconstructing. You're putting the tissues back where they're supposed to be. And how long is that surgery? It takes about two and a half to three and a half hours, depending on the person. So, and I actually like the way you've said that. It's You're just putting people back to the way they used to be. It's oh. not like as if you're changing them. Sorry, if men got pregnant and yeah. had diastasis and needed this procedure done, it would absolutely be covered by health insurance. Yeah. But it's not because it's cosmetic procedure. So it's all self-funded, which is 
crazy. People have like these gaps, you know, it can be six, Massive. ten more centimetres of a gap between the rectus muscle. I showed me, look, like, she put her fist in between her. Yeah. Like, and Tell this me is all down to childbirth, isn't it? Yeah. Or pregnancy. Yeah. Good. Nearly all the time, the, nearly all of the time it's down to pregnancy. And Rob, like, I mean, do, do the operations cost different depending on how much skin people need removed or that? Is it all, is it like a... S- it dep- I, th- I think it depends on the surgeon. Like, you might have, like the way I do it, um... I would have my standard abdominoplasty and then there are modifications of that procedure for somebody maybe who's lost a lot of weight or who, where you need to address around the sides of the back. So if somebody needs what in my practice I call an extended abdominoplasty, so a fleur-de-lis, which is where there's a long scar across the bottom plus a scar in the midline to kind of deal with the horizontal and vertical excess yeah. of skin. Or if we do a 270 degree one where we, you know, the scar goes right around the back to deal with that area, kind of the love handle type area. Yeah. That that's a longer operation, it's the duration of surgery. Okay. Um so so it would be um that you know, you could it's there's a kind of balance between simplicity of structure and so to yeah. let people know what to expect. But I would either have a kind of standard or an extended abdominal plastic. I think most people do something similar. Um and and um you know, the, with it, no matter what the type of skin excision is, that, that plication, that repair of the muscle in the midline and the front is, is done pretty much with, with all the techniques. Okay. And then you redrape the skin and you, you remove the extra skin. So okay. for most people, for a standard abdominoplasty, if you kind of pinch from like your belly button down to your pubic bone like that yeah. piece of skin at the bottom, that's the piece of skin that gets removed. Okay. And then you reshape it. So I love showing people their post-operative photos. I'm like, see that freckle, which is like right up there under your, you know, just above your belly button in the pre-op photo and then you shouldn't say preckle and it's below their belly button in the post-op and they go, oh man, that's wild. You know, so the odd... Do you make them a new belly button? So, yes and no. So we keep the original belly button because it's attached on the deeper level. It kind of, there's a stalk. It's kind of like a, a vase, if you think of it that way. So I cut around it and then leave it attached on its little stalk which goes right down to the abdominal wall. And then I pull the skin down and then I make a new hole in the skin and poke the belly button up through that. The old one. <laughs> You're literally like making shapes with your hands like yes, my like, kids do when they're playing with Lego and yeah, stuff. Yeah, sorry, I can't, I can't do it that without moving my hands. The, the Just make a, make a little hole. and a little hole and stick it in. Yeah, basically. <laughs> I love it. And um, so, yeah, so, so would, would people n- mainly go for just the tummy tuck or do they go for the whole thing? Mostly, you know, mostly people just need a tummy tuck. Oh, do they? Yeah. And can I ask you another thing? Because it struck me there. This whole thing about when people go for cesarean sections and the surgeon just gives them a little tummy tuck while they're at it. Does that actually happen? I don't think so. Because a gynecologist isn't a, gyne- a plastic surgeon. No. So they, you know, they could hardly, I know they can do cesareans, but they can hardly then go in and do what you do. Or maybe they can, but Well, just I mean, like, the, when somebody's just had a baby, like their womb is still quite big. Um, so you can't tighten the tissues around the womb. Yeah. You've all that relaxing, that, you know, hormone that softens your connective tissues. So you wouldn't want to be trying to tighten stuff around yeah, okay. um, that. I think it's a bit of an urban myth, to be honest. Yeah. You might have a bit of a, a, a scar revision. If somebody's had two or three previous cesareans and they've got a bad scar, like they might cut out a little sliver of skin with that old scar in it and, and stitch back up again. Okay. Um, I, I, I don't think anyone would do a full tummy tuck. It, it's, you know, it's, an hour, it's a surgery that takes two and a half to three hours. You know, okay, yeah, you so know, that's just so an urban myth. I, th- I think it's just a bit of an urban Women myth, to be honest. Women actually messaging me and saying they hate their cesarean scars. Is it because they have the little overhang? I think so. Yeah. So can you do something for them? Yeah, like, so it depends on what else is going on. Um, so if somebody's got this overhang, very densely stuck scar, and not really anything else in terms of concern, um, sometimes you can do a much more localised position, kind of uh, operation, like a scar revision. I don't like kind of cutesy names for surgeries it's actually I like mommy makeover makes my teeth itch um, but like the, you know this sort of cute because it's like surgery is serious okay. and, and 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 you know it, it's important not to minimize it and I think yeah you know, anyway there's loads of reasons I don't like that sort of language but you can if it's if there isn't sort of any diastasis or gap in the muscles and it's a local issue with the cesarean scar being stuck Sometimes a scar revision or a mini tummy tuck where you just deal just with that scar, basically cut out the scar and, 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 and restitch it in layers from the bottom up. You can get a smoother contour Okay. with that. Um, like we do talk about things like microneedling and so on for scars, but where you're talking about something that's indented like that, microneedling is, it, isn't going to 
or other or subcision is the other one where you cut underneath, and that can sometimes again work. But um, so that what a subcision is is without actually cutting out the scars, um, using like a sharp needle to kind of cut the strands of tissue underneath. Yeah. Um, but it kind of depends on what factors are contributing to it. So it's probably a surgical procedure, um, to to kind of address that. The the typical thing is that scar that's really kind of stuck up, and there's a little pooch of skin hangs over it and people people are really bothered by that but a lot of the time there's a contributory thing to the lower abdomen being kind of curved where actually that scar at the deeper levels the the rectus abdominis muscles the six-pack muscles are splinted a little bit apart from each other as well okay and that often happens with a cesarean scar that contributes to that rounding of the lower abdomen yeah so it might not just be a skin thing so you might need to address that as part of a procedure but that's where like a very focused clinical exam putting a hand on, feeling where the muscles are sometimes, you know, you know, kind of figuring out exactly which layer, like I was saying, which bit of the anatomy is contributing to the appearance that's causing the patient concern. Okay, so yeah, so it's not just a quick, quick fix. Actually. No, it's you actually... You actually take a lot of consideration there. Yeah, and it's, it's the procedure that has the longest rehab of any of the operations I do. Okay. Yeah. Oh, the recovery from a tummy tuck is pretty tough going. Okay, tell um, me. Yeah, so it's, so it's your core. It's at the middle of everything you do. So with... Other surgeries like breast reduction surgery, a lot of the time patients will go home from hospital and say, you know, I was prescribed stronger painkillers, I didn't really need anything stronger mm. than paracetamol. Like a lot of the time people take something that have been given an oxy what's it? And, <laughs> and they might take that the evening of surgery and then they go home and they, they manage with regular paracetamol. You're, you're not going to do that after a tummy tuck. It's like, you know, if you've done no exercise mm. and then you, this was me last week, actually, I went and I did um, a three rep, rep max squat and I had to walk down the stairs backwards all weekend because <laughs> my quads were so sore. But it's like that really intense Dom's type pain. Okay. Um, so it's pretty significant discomfort. You need stronger painkillers. And are you, are you sent home all wrapped as well? I, we have this sort of binder. So it's yeah. like, it's like a tummy wrap sort of thing that you sometimes see after people, it seems to be more of a thing in the States, but that people are given for after cesarean births. And um, so you're... The way I do it, there's no drains. It's all dissolving stitches. Um, so you have paper tapes over your wounds and then you have this binder on over it. Um, you're hunched over um, and it's sore to cough, it's sore to sneeze. You know, you got to be sure you're taking your Senecot or whatever it is. You really oh, don't want to yeah. get bunged up post tummy tuck. No, okay. it's no fun. Um, and then you kind of gradually straighten up. Um, you know that poster of the evolution of man mm. where it starts off like the caveman? Yeah. And, like that's what I tell people it's going to be like after their tummy tuck. So you start over quite hunched up and then you stand up a bit straighter, a bit straighter, a bit straighter again. Okay. One of the things that people ask me commonly is, is it like recovery from a cesarean? Um, yeah. inter- and well, it depends because people's experience of a cesarean varies wildly. Like you'll have somebody who will have had an emergency cesarean at the end of a really long traumatic labour, okay. you know, on her first baby and she had a really tough time and the recovery from that operation was really hard. Yeah. And you have other people who had like an elective section, you breeze. know, having, you know, and breeze through because they'd done it all before and they were well prepped coming in and they weren't exhausted by being in labour for 48 hours before their operation um, and they recovered without complications. So it's very variable. Some people say... It's easier. Some people say it's harder. But you're six weeks not really doing anything more than gentle walking, you know, and then six weeks to 12 weeks, you're increasing your functional levels. A lot of the patients who come to me because they'll come from physio are really fit. They want to get back. It's their way of staying sane is to get out and do their whatever form of exercise. And that can be a real mental struggle for people when they don't have their, like their coping mechanism for the stresses of life you know it's like I'm just going to go for a walk I'm just going to go for a run oh, like yeah. people really struggle with that I, I I would if that was me I wouldn't like even yesterday I was so down in the dumps and I when I did a bit of exercise I was fine but if I don't yeah I'm miserable so that yeah that and that's a common a thing that happens issue. after any operation is that okay. people's mood takes a dip around three to four weeks post-op anyway for any okay. surgery and um, so to combine that with you know people who function at a really high level um, not being able to exercise so that's where Women's health physios, again, if somebody's seen them pre-op, they know their baseline and they can work them back through sort of Pilates type exercises and build back up their function. But it's it's a good 12 weeks before you're kind of unrestricted exercise following a tummy tuck. And then you're out of training for three months. So you're going to have to build back up to all those things you were able to do before. So it's quite a long recovery. Um, and so it's not something to be taken lightly. No, absolutely not. Hence, we're going to get on to the going to Turkey like, with these operations because we yeah. discussed it briefly before yeah. we came in here um, there was a lady that died there recently in Turkey yeah. after getting a, was it a breast reduction she was getting I don't know the details of the case okay. at all um, I 
think it may have been an abdominal surgery. I've heard oh one thing I said. Like you just have to tell me everything that's done, okay? And can you imagine that being done and botched and then coming back here to Ireland? Because I'd say people in Ireland, Jesus, you'd be afraid to touch someone because you know what was done to them in the first instance. Yeah. And then all those complications that go wrong. So um, how, you know, what are people like you saying about that? And what are, there are actual surgeons, plastic surgeons in Turkey and they, they're very worried too, aren't they? Absolutely. So, so there's, look, I think it, we have to address the, the fact that people do go. Um, there's loads of reasons, in my view, to be worried about. There, there's recently, I'm a member of the British Association of Aesthetic Plastic Surgeons, which entertainingly is called BAPS. <laughs> Oh, BAPS. I love it. <laughs> which is, you know, always good How for like... ironic. Well, there used to be BAPS, which was the British Association of Plastic Surgeons, was BAPS, and then there was BAPS for the Aesthetic <laughs> Plastic Surgeons. So we always got... But then BAPS turned into BAPRAS and the, the joke was gone. But anyway, I digress. Um, so so BAPS is a really good organisation. It's an association of Aesthetic Plastic Sorry, Surgeons. Sorry, I'm still laughing. I know. It's called BAPS. I'm anyway, glad it's on, not stop, just me. Just it's stop it, Laura. Just, <laughs> this is my silly humour now. No, that's okay. okay. That, that, that's why I said I felt <laughs> you <to> appreciation. <laughs> but there was a joint statement released towards the end of June um, from the BAPS and the, the equivalent association in Turkey and the Turkey so- Turkish Association of Aesthetic Plastic, Re- Aesthetic Plastic Reconstructive Surgeons. And they... Together, like there's concerns, there's obviously similar concerns in the UK that would be here about people travelling for surgery and unfortunately fatalities and what what you, that that's the tip of the iceberg. There's a huge number of people coming back with bad outcomes and sick and, and, and you know, significant problems. Um, but, but that statement kind of covered a few things. One, it's actually illegal in Turkey um, for patients to travel for surgery until they've had, they should have their consent process completed before they travel um, so in other words if you're going to have a breast reduction that you have had your consultation you've had a discussion of the risk the consequences the benefits the outcomes and so on and you've signed up your consent form um, and we know from anecdotally that that's not happening because people are arriving saying oh, I went and I was going to get my breast done but I decided while I was there I get my eyelids done as well <gasps> or while, they, while I was there and people are signing consent forms in Turkish so that's actually illegal in Turkey um, well, so I heard of some woman who brought her son over to get um, a hair transplant and while she was in there, she decided to go for breast reduction surgery just on a whim. Yeah. And ended up with complications. Now, she didn't die, but she was very sick. So he comes out of his hair transplant and was told, oh, yes, your mother is really unwell. So uh, you can imagine the level of trauma there, too. Yeah. This idea of just going over and doing something but on it's, a whim. But like what I say to people, would, if I said to you, what, you want to buy a car, let's say you decide you're going to buy, I don't know, a Volkswagen Golf and you're going to buy a second time one. And um, you had to pay, I don't know how much a golf is. I Ex- wouldn't know. I have no idea. <laughs> I have a big yoke, a big van yoke to carry my brood around <laughs> with me. Let's, I'm just picking a random kind of I car. Know. But let's say, you know, if you got, and somebody said it's a two-year-old car and it's got 20,000 kilometres on the clock and it's X, Y and Z and it costs this much in Ireland, you can get the same car online from Turkey and it's half price. Would you buy a second-hand car from Turkey? Most people say, no, I haven't mm. seen it. I haven't. No, there has to be something wrong with it. Mm-hmm. But people would make that decision about having surgery in their bodies. And it is much cheaper there because the indemnity costs are much lower um, and it's cheaper to, like nurses are, you know, salaries are different and all that sort of stuff. So the, there is a cost thing to it, but it's it's that, that thing about, you know, you should be, and Turkish surgeons, properly qualified good plastic surgeons in Turkey are really worried about this. So consent should be done in advance. You should know who your surgeon is. You should know how long they've been, um, working in plastic surgery because the training is different there. It's not equivalent to what the training we have here. So here you want somebody who's FRCS plus. That means a properly qualified plastic surgeon who's been through the sort of path that I described myself having gone through earlier. Um, you know, there should be aftercare in place, all these things. And I think if, you know, you're hopping on a plane to Turkey and you're going to meet your surgeon for the first time there, you're already somewhat committed to that surgery because um, you're travelling um, and you haven't... You're only finding out when you when you get there if you're even being, you know, taken through a proper consent process, what the risks and the consequences and the benefits are. And you're already at risk because you've just come off a four and a half hour flight. Your risk of a DVT, a blood clot in your leg, is quite high because you've just come off a flight. Like with my patients, I say no long haul travel and I define that as anything kind of beyond around, you know, kind of outside Europe um, for six weeks before surgery and six weeks after surgery. So if somebody, and I've done it, if somebody, if we, you know, somebody you know, says, oh, well, actually, I'm coming back from wherever, so I have to, you know, can't attend that appointment because I'm going to be in whatever. And we say, hold on, that's within six weeks of the day of your planned surgery. We're cancelling your operation and booking it for when you haven't been travelling in the last six weeks. 
Like I've done that and I will do it again because that's what's safe. So I cannot reconcile that to how it's safe for somebody to go and have surgery, sometimes multiple procedures, you know, tummies and tummy and breasts or tummy and labiaplasty or eyelids and whatever else, and then hop on a plane and come home. Um, you know, and I, I it's... Are these qualified plastic surgeons that are doing this? Not, necess- not necessarily. So what kind of pe- surgeons are they? They can be people with a medical degree with minimal experience in... How, I, so I can't even understand how someone would want to do that to another person, as in think that it's okay. I can't but, fathom you know, it. I can't. Even, even, you know, there is this thing where I think so, some pharmacists can administer Botox yeah. in other countries. And I'm like, I'd have to go back and do an entire medical degree to even be comfortable because I we don't do anat- the anatomy of the face yeah. in pharmacy. So, you know, I, I just can't understand how someone would be happy enough to just slice into someone. Uh, nor can I. I, I, I like, it, it, it boggles my mind. I can't understand how an eth- and somebody who's pra- practicing ethically can, can do an operation without obtaining fully informed consent from the patient. And that's, uh, fully informed consent is not like making sure the signature is on a page. It's about a process that you go through with the patient with properly examining them, looking at their, you know, underlying health conditions, their medications, their, so getting an idea of the psychology of the patient, which you go, which we don't formally assess every patient we see, but we have a conversation. And by the end of the conversation, somebody may have said something that just makes you go, okay, I'm a little bit worried about this. Um, I'm going to get a colleague who's a psychologist to, to see this person and make sure we're all happy that we're doing this safely for people. Like we talk about the patient safety di- di- diamond, except it started off as a diamond now, I think it's got about six points, but you talk about the right operation done, the right patient for the right reasons at the right time, in the right place, by the right person. And I think there's a number of aspects of that which are missing when somebody travels for surgery um, and you know the the if you look on there, there is that joint thing it was on my Instagram it's on the British Association of Aesthetic Plastic Surgeons website there is guidance for patients considering surgery abroad but even if you go to a really good surgeon um, and have a really good operation and there's really good surgeons in Turkey who do really good operations at the end of the day if you're four weeks post-op and you're home and you run into problems which can happen I have patients who run into problems at four weeks post-op any surgeon has patients who potentially are going to have complication what are you going to do who is there to mind you what number can you call how can you have certain someone see you and that's where the problems arise as well because um, so they might end up having to go into the public system here or else go on a waiting list to see a plastic surgeon or else pay an Irish plastic surgeon to redo whatever issue there is. Yeah, and it may ultimately end up costing more. Um, and some of the stories you hear, you know, one story that was, you know, I heard was somebody who'd had breast implants done um, and went to see a plastic surgeon. This was in the UK. Um, and the plastic surgeon said, look, those implants are exposed. I can see your implants. They need to come out. You're going to get, basically, you're going to get septic is what happens in that situation. Um, you're going to get a really bad infection. You, you could die. You need to have your implants out. And the patient contacted back her surgeon in Turkey who said, no, 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 you've been advised wrong. You just need to get somebody who, who will stitch you back up again. Now, if you stitch somebody back up again who's got an exposed breast implant, they will get septic. They And they will potentially die if that infection isn't properly managed. So it's it's really scary and it's upsetting to think of patients you know who are in that vulnerable position and um, being maybe badly advised and it's not every Turkish surgeon and it's not just Turkey there's problems here there and everywhere but generally speaking you should have your operation somewhere close to where your surgeon is mm. you know and so you need to have that access to your surgeon post-operatively that if there's a problem they can say, well, come in and I'll see you and I'll check things. And yeah, you need you, you need some flu clocks. You, you need yeah. X, Y and Z. You need to, we need to change your dressing sense. And just say you're on holidays. You can refer them to a colleague that can help them as well in oh, absolutely. Ireland. So, and that's what, and that's the beauty of it, I suppose. Yeah, like we, we would always have cross covers. So, yeah. so when I go on leave, one of my colleagues covers me. Yeah. And when he's on leave, I cover him and we have an agreement there, you know, that we, that patients are never left without. Um, cover, but also they will have their documentation, their dis- discharge summaries in English, <laughs> you know, yeah, um, exactly. and the GP has been communicated with. Um, so I will write to the, pa- the patient's GP and say, I did a breast reduction for this patient on whatever date and this is what happened and this is blah, 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 blah. And so it's about continuity of care. And sometimes people worry about their GPs knowing about I was them having say had surgery. You, does, like, does that have to happen or could someone say, sorry, I don't want my GP knowing? Somebody can, can say that. Um, if they don't say it, does it automatically go to the GP? No. Okay. No. So um, 
the medical council guidelines say that we should. Okay. Um, and so on my paperwork that people, p- patients fill out, I have, you know, permission to communicate with the GP and I include in that the fact that the medical council says that I should be communicating with the patient's GP. Okay. But if they specifically opt out of it, um, then that's fine. I can't force them to do that now. Okay. You know, it's... Um, Because often people don't even want their families to know, you know, and but that comes back to the whole thing that we're talking about, like it being stigmatized in the first place. Yeah, Yeah. and if you're having a breast surgery done, your GP does know about, and you know you're going to have your mammogram at some point. Actually, that's (laughs) and the report's going to say that. So the mammograms post breast reduction. Yeah, and actually, sorry, can I just ask you one question? Some lady said she has thirty two double J. Oh, cracky! And she just wants them lifted. They're very saggy. But do you lose some breast tissue if you're doing that? I I think your answer is going to be yes. You would have to because you need to make space to do the lift. Okay, yeah. Um, you know, so you See, can do it. Already, a, I'm like half a plastic surgeon. I just said like I knew what go. was going to happen there. See, you just have to do the hand <laughs> gestures now. <laughs> One of those Turkish ones. That just, I know. Um, so you probably will. So the, you can do with a reduction. You can remove more or less tissue. So. If she went to see a plastic surgeon and said, I want to have this procedure done, but I want to keep as much tissue as possible. I really don't want to be much smaller. Then the surgeon will explain what's viable. Because we, when we lift the nipple, we have to make space for it to lift up into. Yeah, okay. Um, but certainly you can, that would always, be, and that would be part again of the preoperative counselling process. So if you're, you know, have an opportunity to discuss a nuanced you know, that's, that's fairly nuanced what she's saying there, where, mm-hmm. you know, that, that would be part of a good preoperative consultation as okay. opposed to do a bog standard breast reduction. Because okay. some people say, make me as absolutely small as you can. Other people say, look, I don't want, I have a set of hips on me. I don't want to be, you know, pear shaped. I want to be out and then in and then out again. Okay. <laughs> you know, which is what most people want. So that's where you're, you're, you're trying to get through the process of, of preoperative counselling and discussion. You know, I'd see all my patients twice before I do an operation for them to really make sure that we're on the same page in terms of what we can achieve. Okay. Mammograms, post-breast implants and yep. post-breast reduction. Can the breast implants be burst? If they, I have seen some patients who have had maybe older implants because um, as, as implants age, they do become a bit more fragile and they are a little bit more likely to fracture or burst. A bit like ourselves, really. Yeah. yeah. It's going <laughs> to get a bit sort of sad and flumpy. <laughs> <laughs> so the um, mammograms post breast reduction are actually more straightforward. They're just standard mammograms. The patient needs to obviously need to be healed up before after surgery. And um, the patient needs to inform the radiographer and anyone who listens to them that they've had breast reduction done, even if it's 20 years ago, because there's changes to the internal architecture of the breast. And when the radiologist reads the scan, if they look and say, oh, this looks different to their previous one, and then looks at the clinical details, oh, but she's had a breast reduction. So the changes so long as they're, you know, they they probably be typical post-surgical changes. So that would be, with the breast reductions, that's right for it. I always say to patients, look, it may change things and you may end up having either additional imaging or maybe, maybe a biopsy or something done to confirm that the changes seen are post-surgical. Um, so you probably on balance slightly increase your risk of, of being poked or prodded, <laughs> you know, in yeah. the future. And patients understand that and they're, they're quite accepting of it. Um, with the breast augmentation where somebody has implants, Yes, particularly with older implants, there may be a higher rate of the, and I've certainly had, it's hard to know because you can get silent rupture. The implants kind of hold their shape even if the shell cracks. And sometimes people will say, well, my breast was really squashed when I was having my mammogram and they will attribute that to being when their implant ruptured, but we don't always know that it happened because okay. unless they have an ultrasound done prior to the mammogram and another one done afterwards, we don't know at what, what point in time the implant ruptured because you could be walking around with a ruptured implant for years. And um, is that dangerous to walk around with one for years? Um. It can be. I'll come back to that. But just to finish on the mammogram thing, you just need special views. So they usually can't have their mammograms done in the chip van, you know, the roaming. So oh, they need yeah. to go into the thing. So, okay. And they just take slightly different views and what are called displacement views where they try and image a bit more of the breast tissue with the implant out of the way. Coming back to the rupture implants. Um, so the implants that we use are filled with cohesive silicone gel so what that means is it's not liquid silicone so if you cut through an implant it's a bit like jelly like you'd have at a child's birthday party like it kind of holds its shape so if the shell of the implant cracks um it's not like the same or the the silicone's going to flow out and your breast is going to change how it looks so you can have a silent rupture um and 
the capsule, which I mentioned earlier, which is the tissue that forms around the implant. If, if you have a ruptured implant and the silicone only stays inside the capsule, so in other words, it doesn't go beyond it, that's what's called an intracapsular rupture. So it hasn't travelled outside it. You can get an extra capsular rupture where the silicone spreads beyond that and then you can get, go, you can get granulomas or little sort of um, inflammatory lumps in the breast or in the armpit, in the, in the lymph glands there if you get extra capsular rupture. So if somebody has a ruptured implant, they're best to have it removed before the silicone has a chance to move outside of that area and to cause these silicone granulomas or lymphadenitis, the swelling of the lymph glands. Um, because it, it just causes extra kind of potential, it makes it a little bit more complex and, and potentially they'll have fi- get further lumps down the line, which can be bothersome. Okay. So And they can't remove those lumps, they're kind of in the tissue, isn't that right? You, yeah, well you can, um, but particularly with the lymph glands, as you tend to find you can, you, somebody could have, you know, silico, a silicone infiltrated lymph node, Okay. You know, so it's, and you can take it out, but there'll still be a bit of the silicone floating around, and you'll get another one at later points. So then you get these lumps in your armpits. It's not, it's not super common, but it can happen. So you're not selling it to me. No, yeah. <laughs> no, yeah, which is why. So in Ireland, there isn't any specific recommendation about having your implants monitored. In the states, the recommendation is that you have a breast MRI done every three years okay. from the time of implant to to check for the presence of silent rupture. Okay. Um, I recommend to my patients that they have an ultrasound done by an experienced breast radiologist every three years or so because it's in the hands of an experienced radiologist it's almost as sensitive as MRI, as MRI in terms of detecting yeah. a rupture. So, And obviously if you notice any changes in your breast of course. You, know, you, you have them checked. Can I ask you what other surgeries you do? You can. So what <laughs> do you do post bariatric surgery where you'd be tightening up a lot of the loose skin kind of on the arms and the thighs? I or I don't do a lot of that, and one of the reasons for that is that um, well, there's a few reasons for it. Those operations take a very long time, and I'm kind of single-handed surgeon, so um, those operations are very long. Okay. <laughs> um, and so they, as a result of that, because it's self-funded stuff, very long equals very expensive. Okay. And so I was finding I did do a bit of them, and and, and what I found was patients come and see me. I say yes, I can do this, but this is how much it's going to cost, and people say that's I can't, yeah. you know. So it, there are surgeries which are better done with, you know, a couple of surgeons or a team of surgeons, you know, who can, you know, somebody can be sewing up one side while somebody's sewing up the other side. So, okay. um, so I don't do those, but I would do, so I do a lot of breast reductions, breast augmentations, uplift, symmetrizing sort of stuff, you know, if somebody's got one breast bigger than the other or whatnot. I do tummy tuck surgeries, I do labiaplasty surgeries. Do you do many labiaplasty? Um, a reasonable amount. Okay. Yeah. Um, and again, that's something where people give themselves a really hard time about it. And then, you know, it's it's a procedure that if somebody needs, they functionally can do really well from it mm. um, and be really pretty happy. Because, yeah. you know, people, they, you know, it's sore when they walk, they run, they get chafing, irritation, it's sore during intercourse, it's, they can't cycle, they can't, all these things are really uncomfortable. Um, you know, so that's a great operation, actually, for, for um, patients who need it. Um, and somebody said, I was actually talking to a lovely patient. I do her Botox for her, and we we're talking talking about this last week. And she's like, "But how do you know?" And I'm like, "If you need a labiaplasty, you'll, you'll know. know. You'll know. Yeah, all about it. you'll know about it." So I do that, and that's sort of. And then I do some eyelid surgeries as well, so upper eyelids. Um, and that would be kind of the remit, my aesthetic remit. I do loads of skin cancer surgeries, benign skin lesion surgeries okay. as well. So I do a lot. And you do but Botox as well. Oh yeah. Okay, and fillers and stuff. Do you yeah. do your own Botox? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because when you come in, when you come in <laughs> the door, I was like, oh my God, you look so... Because you know the way some, you look at someone's profile picture on Instagram, they're totally different in real life. Oh really, do I look totally different? Well, you just well, my hair is down. younger and... Uh-huh. I don't know. It's, yeah. Yeah. No, I... Yeah, no, I, I'm a big fan of the old Botox. Okay. So... So, and what... Like, you know, if you were to get... If you... Would you have an issue getting surgery yourself if you needed to get surgery done? Or is it... You know what I mean? No, I don't think so. I think that I remember um, the first operation that I saw being done that I went, do you know what, I think I'll get that done, was I saw somebody having her upper eyelids done when I was a trainee. I was with one of my bosses and this lady, and she very heavy upper, upper eyelids. And I was, um, I saw him do the surgery and I just remember looking going, wow, when the time comes, I'm getting that done. Okay, fair <laughs> yeah, enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like, if you, need, if you need something, if it's bothering you, yes, I would, you know. Okay. Um, you know, in the same way that I'm very open about having Botox, like people sort of say, which why would you tell people? I'm like, because oh, I yeah. have it. And it, like, oh, for goodness sake, sure, no cream is going to do that to you. No, <laughs> and like, but why, but why, what's, I like how it looks on my face. Some people yeah. don't like how Botox looks on their faces and that's, and don't like how it feels. 
that's fine. That's yeah. up to them. Um, but I don't, what I don't like is um, people sort of saying, no, I haven't done that. And like, it's nobody's, I can understand if somebody's like in the public eye um, and everyone's talking about them. I would hate that. I'd hate to be the sort of subject of, of mm. things. But I think if, if you're in the business and you're talking to people about it and people worry, what I find with injectables is there's, 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 there's some bad Botox and fillers out there. And a lot of time people come to me and they're like, I don't want to look crazy. I don't want to look nuts or whatever else. And I would say to them, well, do you think I look nuts? <laughs> if they say yes, that's probably the end of the consultation. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but generally people say, well, do you have Botox? And they say, yes, I do. Yeah. And so it, it can be reassuring in the same way, you know, if you're going to buy, buy foundation and somebody's orange, you may well end up with an orange face when you yeah. buy your foundation. So if you're going to somebody for in- injectables or, or that end of things, that the aesthetic of your practitioner will probably be reflected in what you get. So if you go to somebody who has very overdone fillers or Botox, whatever else, that's probably what they think looks good. So that may well be how you look after you have your injections done. Whereas if you go to somebody who maybe has a more natural aesthetic, I mean, it's not natural. It's not natural for me not to be able to frown. Um, but generally speaking, it's not a very super overdone look um, that I would be doing for my patients. So it, you just it's the same as anything else. You look at their before and after photos or you look at their face and you say, right, that's yeah. kind of what I like. Of course. Yeah, but I think it, it makes people feel really good. Oh, yeah. No, it makes me yeah. feel, it makes me look less tired than I would otherwise. And that's why I got it done. Yeah. Not to look 30, but to look, to look a be- like a better 43 year old. Yeah. So I'd never pretend that I wasn't getting it done. Um, while you were going through sur- your surgical training and that, did you experience much misogyny as a <laughs> as a young female trainee? There's been a recent um, book come out by a doctor, a breast surgeon over in the UK, and she said, you know, there was awful. Like she's done out like a hashtag Me Too for herself, yeah, um, and just said there was awful misogyny like over the surgery. You know, she just wanted to get trained, so she said she just put up with it. But like looking back on it, it's horrendous and. Yeah, I th- I think some of the stuff when you look back at some of the stuff that was said to you, um, I kind of think Christ, that what, you know, really was there. There was definitely a bit of that. There was, um, y- there was some that was more overt than others. That look, most people I worked with were brilliant, but you know, kind of kind of joking comments about well, don't don't go and have any babies, oh, you know, and like, well, hold on now. When you think about that, really, is that an appropriate thing to say to somebody who's your junior, who's a yeah. woman? No. <laughs> Um, and they're, de- they're definitely I remember somebody else sort of saying oh you know he was only a couple of years older than me um, and in a different specialty and saying oh I love seeing like women you know you know getting onto the training schemes and stuff like that it's brilliant and I'm like oh yeah you know thinking and he was like yeah jobs for the boys because the, the, the implication being that we would train up and then we go off and have you know get married and have babies and not finish our training so yeah yeah there were there was definitely so, some stuff and then more subtle stuff in terms of I don't don't know if it's subtle sometimes like the attitude you'd encounter um not being taken seriously um you know or by patients or by other healthcare professionals both yeah both um I mean, it does sexist remarks like this. This lady said, you know, she'd be trying to operate, and the doctor would be like, "Oh, so how many people did you sleep with last night?" I don't or think I ever had anything that okay. over it, to be honest. Um, but yeah, no, you know, definitely sort of inappropriate stuff, and and you know, being held to a different standard for sure to to male colleagues. Um, you know, behavior that might be acceptable in a male colleague would be unacceptable in a female colleague in terms of, you know, um what would be expected of them to do for themselves and a, a woman to do for themselves, you know. It, it, so there was definitely that. And, um, you know, it's not to say that there w- weren't some amazing mentors and uh, and all that sort of stuff, but you, there was, and look, it sometimes still happens. People just don't kind of get that maybe. Yeah. I mean, occasionally people come and see me and say, and who's going to be doing the operation? I'm like, I mean, that would be me. <laughs> I am the surgeon. <laughs> I am the surgeon. Yeah. You know, so that people just sometimes can't wrap their head around it. I I take it more of a compliment these I days. I think you should. It's just because you look so young and you do your Botox so well. Yeah, well, maybe that's it. But I think <laughs> that's it. So just take it as a compliment. But yeah. No, and do you think that though that is changing in medicine because there's more females being, uh, there are more females in medicine, there are more females, to, uh, you know, training to consultant level, doing the jobs that would typically have been performed by men. Or do you think that, or do you think that women are harder on each other too in some in some ways? Well, they they can be. I mean, I think 
one of the things that's you, I, you look, you constantly have to prove yourself when you're a trainee because you're moving around and you're a different hospital, different hospital, new set of colleagues, and and so that there, there's there can be perceptions around female doctors. There's definitely more of us now. Like when I started in the Beacon, I remember looking at the board in the consultants clinic when you go in, and I think I was the second, maybe third female name on that board. Okay, like there was myself. There was one other that I think of. There might have been a third, but. And now when I look at that board, there's loads of women on it okay. um, across all specialties. So that's really encouraging to see. And, um, you know, I, you know, there's definitely more women around, but also I suppose I'm getting older, I'm getting more mature. My peer group are now in consultant positions. But um, I think there's, there's, you will still come across some, some of that. And, you know, you, you will meet some patients who expect... Or, or people in your life who, who, who will have a sexist attitude. Yeah. But, I mean, you can't go through life. You can't th- go through any bit, uh, you know, no. of life without encountering a little bit of that. Mm-hmm. So it's just how you deal with it and realising the problem is maybe not you, but them. Yeah, that's you a know. great statement, actually, isn't it? Yeah. Is there anything else that you'd like to add before I ask you my two burning questions? Your two burning questions. Uh, no, I don't think so. Just go for it if you want it, isn't that right? Yeah, like in terms of, I think, for women in medicine um, and, and young women in medicine, I think one of the things that got said to me a lot was, God, it's really hard. It's really hard to do it. And actually my career as teacher in school, I remember her saying to me, you know, you do all those aptitude tests and transition year. And me saying, I think I want to do medicine. And her saying, God, it's a very hard job for a woman. <laughs> <laughs> so I think I think the thing is, it is hard and it's it, it's hard for, for um, to, to, to be a surgeon, male or female. It's a really hard job and there's a lot to it. Um, but, you know, sometimes things are hard and it doesn't mean you shouldn't do them you know, that way. Yeah. And I think that people say it to women because of the family element mm. and, oh, it's hard to be a woman and do medicine and all the training and everything and have your babies on time and all this, you know. But I think that I see certainly within my peer group and the, the women that I would have gone to school with that are now doctors, they're managing that Quite well. They're all a bit frazzled, but sure, who isn't frazzled? Well, we're all frazzled. Yeah, yeah that's, that's like modern life. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Or just life full stop. And I think we're, we're all getting more and more used to it too as well, aren't we, about the, kind of that, that management. But yeah, I think that that's a good statement. If it's ha- just because it's hard, it doesn't mean don't do it. Yeah. You know, I, 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 for sure. Um, you know, and if I think that's the other thing is like the thing about franticness of everyday life. I was I, a few years ago, I was listening to this thing on the radio and they're reading out. I wish you see, I wish I was able to tell you the exact source, but it was somebody who they were talking on the radio and they're reading out the statement of like life has never been busier and we've never had more demands on our time and expecting this and that brother. And it was something that was written in Victorian times. Yeah. So, so I think we've always had this thing as humans, like we're so busy, like nobody's busier than we are right now. And I think it's just the human condition. We're drawn towards that thing of being busy and productive. Um, and it's just, you know, I think that's just life. Well, we wouldn't have evolved to the species that we are today if we didn't always look for other things to be done. Sure, we didn't. Yeah, didn't. driving forwards. Yeah, hundred percent. So, Ailish, what advice would you give young people today? So, I was kind of thinking about this. I'm kind of two two things that I was thinking. I was kind of debating between the two, but I think I think it's okay to be yourself. Is, is one thing. So I think there, there's a, a pressure to conform and there's a pressure on young people to behave a certain way, to look a certain way, to think a certain way about stuff. And it's okay to not agree with people and it's okay to um, not necessarily conform. And that kind of comes back, I was kind of framing it a little bit in terms of my experience of, of training as a surgeon, that there was like expected surgeon behaviour which was kind of old school and it was mostly male behaviour. And in terms of how you behaved and interacted with colleagues, it, it didn't always sit well, but you went into those behaviour patterns, which could sometimes be kind of obnoxious um, slash, you know, a little toxic in those interactions with colleagues and stuff. And it took me quite a long time to say, actually, do you know what? That's not actually me. And it's OK to be actually quite feminine, my interactions with people. Um, and, you know, it didn't make me less of a surgeon to be maybe a bit vulnerable or to, you know, sometimes hug my patients or whatever it might be. Like less so since COVID, but I do like a good hug. Um, and and that it was, you know, kind of being true to yourself. Um, I think that's actually a really important thing that you, 
you you don't it's okay being you is enough and being you is okay and just because it's not how everybody else in a particular field sphere environment thinks or acts um it doesn't mean you're wrong it's just maybe they're all conforming and they're not comfortable with what they're doing either so I think that's kind of that was one thought I had on that yeah. and also that it's okay to say no and not to have to explain yourself so when you asked me to do this podcast, it would have been totally fine for me to say, no thanks, Laura. Yeah. And to not follow up with, I'm just so busy and I'd really like to blah, blah, Just say, it's okay to say no. And I think that's particularly important for women. No, no thank you. But without feeling that we have to explain ourselves constantly. I think that's a really important thing as well to put the, to, to value your own kind of time and everything else. Um, when people are asking you to do things. So I know that's two sort of separate things, but I think they're kind of related to I each really other. I really like that one about the saying no without having to explain yourself. Yeah. Like, I mean, you can, but you don't mm. necessarily owe people an explanation. Like you said to me, can you do this? I, it would have been absolutely fine for me to say, no, thank you. I would have thought you were a bitch, but... I'm only I'm really <laughs> <laughs> well, you see, but, 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 but maybe you would have, but that would be... That'd be my problem. That would be you, exactly. not me. Exactly, so, exactly. So that no, is I love it. And by the way, I would not have thought that you were a bitch. List of people I don't <laughs> like. <laughs> oh, <no>. Line. I've <laughs> got kind of an X beside my name. <laughs> Never asking her again. Yeah. Um, and what is the meaning of life? So... It was funny, like not long after you asked me to do this, which is a little while back, because obviously the jigs and the wheels got us to this point. We had um, a memorial workout in my gym for a friend who di sadly died six years ago now. And his very good friend gave this lovely talk um, on the day that we did the workout. And what he said was, and I, it, I was like, that's it. I mean, the meaning of life is to be alive. Yeah. We're here. We get to do this. Um, like, it's not more complicated than that. Like on my way here today, I was kind of, I was feeling philosophical, obviously. But I was looking, I drove past an old man and he was having, I was like, what's he doing? I was kind of waiting in traffic and he was just, there was a cat sitting on top of a gate pier and your man had stopped at his walk and he was just saying hello to the cat and giving the cat rubs and he was obviously enjoying it. Yeah. And he was just doing it. There was nothing special about it. It's just daily life. I like cats. I'm going to do that. And you don't get to do that if you're not alive. Um, and you don't get to, you know, I saw another person like there's like a book library thing in the outside of school near where I live and there was somebody and she was rooting through and she was taking out a book and it's a really simple thing but it's just it doesn't have to be big fancy you don't have to be pursuing some big ideal you don't have to be doing anything we just we get to be here we get to do this we get to experience life and that's the, the really I don't think is anything more to it I love it yeah I really do and it has been an absolute pleasure. And I've learned loads from you today. And I know that so many others are going to. Where can people find you? I, well, I work in the Beacon Clinic um, and the Beacon Hospital down in Sandiford. So. OK, and what's your Instagram handle in case people want to get in touch with you? Via the well, nice, nice, short, snappy one. It's Fitzgerald Plastic Surgery. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I didn't think that through when I was I love it. Shorter. I love it. But anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll have the introduction and everything on the, before we start. So uh, Super. thank you so very much for your time. It's been wonderful. You're welcome. I enjoyed that. <laughs> thank you.